Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Most believers want a better understanding of the end times and and what it will look like when the Lord returns. The problem is, the issue is very complex and there's huge differences of opinions. And yet, today we're studying 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to try to avoid some of the controversy and just take a straightforward approach to this passage, trying to understand what Paul has to say about the return of Christ. So welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast. My name is Russ Brewer. I'm pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. This is our daily podcast. It's going through one key chapter of the Bible each day, trying to understand it in light of the overall message of God's Word. So today we are in a new book of the Bible, 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to be starting in chapter 4 for a few reasons. For one thing, although the first three chapters of this book are filled with rich, practical, personal material, we're working against the calendar, and I'd like to finish the New Testament by the end of this year, so we have to be razor sharp in our focus about which key chapters we work through. Plus, since this study is devoted to the key chapters of the Bible, we're focusing on the key chapters that specifically help us understand the overall plan of God and His message to us today. And so while the first three chapters of 1 Thessalonians are obviously God's Word, chapters 4 and 5 are truly necessary to understand the message of Scripture. And at that point, to understand chapter 4, we need to see how this passage fits into the overall Word of God. Now, if you have been with us since the beginning of this year, then you'll remember that God has a series of promises that he's been making throughout the entire Bible, specifically starting back in the Old Testament in Genesis 3.15, where God promised that one of Eve's descendants would destroy Satan. Then in Genesis 12 and 15, God promised to Abraham that in him all the nations would be blessed. And later on in 2 Samuel 7, God promised to David that he would have an heir on the throne forever. And then in Daniel chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 7, chapter 9, and chapter 12, they all speak of this new kingdom that will be ruled by this king. And in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, they speak of the new covenant that is necessary to enter into this new kingdom. And now, today's passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 builds on this expectation and speaks about the events that surround when Christ will return. But here's the thing. This passage is very controversial on many levels, and there are are several major interpretations, all with decent reasons for why they teach what they teach. And so just to try to avoid some of this controversy, I'm just going to stick with the text. And my hope is that I can just point out some truths that will help you understand this issue more on your own and help to evaluate the various positions that are out there. And so now, before we get to the end times portion of chapter 4, let's first go over the background of this passage and, and work through the first section, which is really calling us to holy living in light of Christ's return. And so, for the background material, 1 Thessalonians is Paul's first letter to the church of Thessalonica. He wrote this letter from Corinth somewhere around 50 or 51 AD. That means this is one of the oldest letters from Paul that we have in our entire Bible. And at this point, only a couple New Testament books even exist. And so the scriptures that the Thessalonians would be reading would be mostly books that we would call the Old Testament. Not only that, when Paul wrote this letter, the church of Thessalonica was brand new, maybe a year old or even maybe younger. Not only that, when Paul started this church in Acts 17, he couldn't stay very long because of the the opposition from the, the community, and that means that this church is full of young Christians who have just started out their journey towards Christ and didn't have a ton of teaching just to establish a strong foundation. And so, for the first few chapters of this letter, Paul writes about various personal details, and it's not until we get to chapter 4 that Paul begins to give them the more theologically robust teaching on holy living in light of Christ's return. And so, with all of that, now that we're at chapter 4, let's start in verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. And so, Paul starts off by calling them to follow the instructions already given to them, which is specifically that they ought to be living to please God, but that they should be excelling even more here. And so, right here, this is a key instruction for how any believer ought to live, specifically that our aim should be increasingly to live lives pleasing to God. Now, practically speaking, a life that pleases God is a life of faith that walks in His holiness and is engaged in His work in this world. And one of the reasons for living a life that pleases the Lord is that Jesus is coming back for His people. 
Now, Paul has already begun to draw the Thessalonians' focus to that day when Christ returns. If you look back at chapter 1, chapter 1 ends in verse 10 with Paul speaking of waiting for Christ to return from heaven and save us from the wrath which is to come. At the end of chapter 2, verse 19, Paul then speaks of them, the church of Thessalonica, being his crown where they will be in the presence of Christ at his return. In chapter 3, likewise, it ends in verse 13 speaking about the holy life we are to live in light of the coming of Christ with his saints. And so these opening verses of chapter 4 continue this theme of living in light of the return of Christ. Now, we may have been walking with Jesus for years, and we may already be living in light of God's word. And yet here in verse 1, Paul calls the Thessalonians and, and even us that we would excel more. For that matter, in light of Christ's return, there is no sacrifice that we will make for him to be more pleasing to him, for where every sacrifice we make will be fully and completely worth it. So let us excel more to live lives pleasing to him. Now in verse 2, Paul reminds them that while he was with them, he gave them various instructions from the Lord. And in verse 3, that the Lord's will for them is sanctification. Now we've talked about sanctification several times in this podcast series. Sanctification is when we live by and live out the holy calling we've received in Christ. It's to live according to the holiness we have in the Lord. And thus Paul says in verse 7, For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. And one of the more common ways that a person can harm their walk in holiness is through sexual immorality. And so in verse 3, Paul tells these believers to abstain from sexual morality, and in verse 4, to control their bodies with holiness and honor. Now, we've already talked about how to deal with sin already in our studies in Romans 6, 8, and Ephesians 4. In Romans 6, we saw that we have been set free from the mastery of sin. In Romans 8, the Holy Spirit crucifies the deeds of our flesh, and in Ephesians 4, we put off the old way of living the old man, and we put on the new way of living that is in the holiness we have in Christ. And to this point, in verse 5, we don't have to be like the Gentiles who don't know God. They may run after sexual morality, but God's people don't have to because we know God. We've been set free from the mastery of sin. We have the Holy Spirit who crucifies the deeds of our flesh, and God is giving us the spiritual grace to put off the old man and put on the new. Now, verse 6 continues this theme, and Paul says that no one is to defraud his brother because the Lord will avenge those sins. In verse 7, God has called us for the purpose of sanctification. And in verse 8, the person who rejects this teaching is rejecting the God who gives his Holy Spirit to us. And so these are important truths regarding a holy life that is looking forward to Christ's return. Now, as we go on in this chapter, then in verse 9, Paul moves on to the topic of love and, and says that they likewise are already doing great when it comes to loving the brethren. And yet, although they're doing great, this too is a component of the Christian life that never stops improving. And so we should continually be transforming our way of interacting with one another, God's people, so that we are deepening and strengthening our love for our church family. Paul then says in verse 11, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we have commanded you, so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Now that word ambition is a picturesque word because it comes from two Greek words. One of the words means to love, the other means to honor, so it literally means to honor or love something. Here it means to love and honor a quiet life and quiet work. Now this this mean that we can't have any loud jobs or we can't be loud people? No, th his point is not that we don't have to be loud. His point is we shouldn't be obnoxious people in our world. Remember, when Paul was going from city to city in this whole region where Thessalonica was situated, Paul kept coming against riots of people. And Paul is showing us that if our citizenship is in heaven, and if that's our focus, we won't be people who engage in that kind of loud rioting. Paul gave a similar instruction in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where he says that we are to pray for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. We also saw in Philippians 4 that we are to be guided by gentleness and peace with the recognition that the Lord is near. And so in a similar fashion here, Paul links this idea of a quiet life of the Lord's return because we should be living for Christ's return for Christ's kingdom and that then brings us to Paul's teaching on the return of Christ in verses 13 to 18. And these verses now bring us to a key section of this chapter, which deals specifically with the return of Christ. Now, like I said a few moments ago, I'm going to give you mostly just some data so you can better understand these verses, this passage, to better understand the various ways that people interpret it and help evaluate how the Word of God is being handled. 
For instance, in verse 13, notice the reason that Paul is giving them this instruction. Any interpretation of this passage needs to fit within Paul's reasons for giving this teaching. And so he gives the reasons for this teaching in verses 13 and 18. In verse 13, he says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. And then down in verse 18, he says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so right here, we're seeing that Paul's reason for giving this instruction is for their comfort. They've already lost loved ones. And it seems like these believers in Thessalonica were thinking that those who died were lost to Christ's kingdom. And and that if you weren't alive when Christ returned, well, you just missed out on the next step of God's plan. And so Paul's first point is about those who have fallen asleep. Now, that term sleep there is just a way of describing death. Sleep implies death of a body, but not death of the soul. And it even implies going to sleep here and waking up with the Lord. And so Paul's point is that not only is it not that those who die miss out, but also those who die go to be with the Lord and they will come back to be with him when he returns. Now, along these lines, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, that to be absent from our body means to be present with the Lord. And so we see in verse 14, Paul says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Paul's actually just made the same point back in chapter 3, verse 13, when he mentions that the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And so those who have died have not missed out. Instead, they're with the Lord and will be with him when he returns. Now, as for what this will look like, let's glance down at verses 15 and 16, where Paul says, For this reason we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And so when the Lord returns, those who are alive, they don't get a head start on the plan of God. They don't precede those who've already died. For, verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, the word of God often associates a trumpet with the return of Christ. Trumpets were used for calling forth armies, declaring victory, going into battle. And several end times passages deal with trumpets. And there's a lot of controversy about which trumpet is being spoken about here. But again, notice how this trumpet blast occurs. It occurs along with three other events. One, when the Lord descends from heaven. Two, when there is some kind of a shout, either from the Lord or from an archangel, it's not entirely clear. And then three, when the dead in Christ are resurrected and join with the Lord. And so when this trumpet blasts, Christ's people who have died will be resurrected from the ground and they will join the Lord. Now, what about Christ's people who are still on the earth at that time? Well, verse 17 is pretty clear. It says, Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. All right, so I said we're going to avoid controversy, but let's just put our big toe a little bit in the controversy. Verse 17 is a passage speaking about an event that we typically call the rapture. The word rapture comes from a Latin reading of this verse where the word caught up is rapimur or something like that. And so when we read verse 17, we see that the event that we call the rapture is an event when Christ is coming back and the dead are resurrected and join him and then we join him and his people are then with him forever. And so people debate when this rapture occurred, but whatever conclusion we arrive at, land at, needs to include the fact that verse 16 says that those who are raptured will be joining with the people being physically resurrected at the same time and that both groups of people will then be with Christ forever. Well, then verse 18 finishes out this chapter, showing Paul's point in telling them these things. It was for their practical comfort. And so he says in verse 18, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so the intent of Paul here is that we would take these truths and then be comforted by them. And so no matter how we understand this passage, we have to understand it from the sense of being comforted by the Lord. And so that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I realize this is just a summary look at this chapter. We didn't say a lot. We left a lot unsaid. But then again, that's basically all that Paul gives the Thessalonians. He leaves a lot out too. And so obviously the Thessalonians needed to understand these words here, just to read them and let them stand on their own. And so what does Paul say? Paul is telling us in this passage that when Christ returns, we who are alive will not have an advantage over those who have already died. Instead, when Christ returns, those who have died will return with him and be joined to their resurrected bodies. And then those who are alive at the time will be raptured and they will join together and be with Christ and his people forever.
All right, so although a lot more can be said, the good news is we're actually not done with this passage because it flows right into chapter 5, which we'll be picking up tomorrow. And so just to remind us of this entire passage here, Paul is calling us to live in light of Christ's return, that we should be living holy lives, loving lives, and lives where we are seeking to excel even more in how to just live in a life that pleases God, in sanctification, and and in love, and, and just looking forward to Christ's return. And when he does return, we can see here, he will call us to him with the shout of an archangel, and we can wait for that day. Well, we're going to again pick this on up tomorrow in chapter 5. And until then, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening, and God bless.